the inverse z transform but presently we are interested in the direct or a general method and this is formally speaking a contour integral and it uses the cauchy's theorem for complex random variable integrations so formally speaking the inverse z transform that is we are interested in finding x of n so this is equivalent to 1 over 2 pi j and then we have a contour integration in the counterclockwise direction with respect to a contour c and then we have the z domain of x of n that is x of z and then we are multiplying it with z n minus 1 dz so here c is actually a circular contour and it is in the region of convergence so an important observation over here is that the variable n is appearing in terms of the z the power of z so this contour integration is valid for all values of n but you would have to select a particular n whether n is greater than or equal to 0 it's less than 0 to find this contour integration so the contour integration can be solved by means of residue theory and by that we mean that x of n has a simple form which is actually a summation of residues evaluated at poles of this function that is x of z z n minus 1 so we have to evaluate the poles of this function and then afterward evaluate residues at that poles and finally we have to sum all residues so in short we can have a z plane and this is the unit circle in that z plane and this is the real axis and we have an imaginary axis so for example if x of z is z over z minus 1 by 2 that is we have a pole at 1 by 2 and moreover this expression says that absolute value of z is greater than 1 by 2 so that means the ROC is outward so this contour C would be evaluated say from here within the region of convergence in the counterclockwise direction and this is our C which is linked with the value of n the time index n over here so in order to understand the use of contour integration in finding the inverse z transform let us look into one example so in this example say we are given with x of z which is simply z over 2 times z minus 1 by 2 times z minus 1 and our region of convergence is greater than 1 so as a first step we have to evaluate this function x of z z n minus 1 so that is we have x of z z n minus 1 that is we have to multiply z of n minus 1 with this function x of z so if we multiply these two this z would cancel with this one so eventually we have z n over 2 z minus 1 by 2 and z minus 1 so from this function we can evaluate poles that is this part of our approach but these poles are dependent on the numerator and specifically at the value uh, of z of n so we can say that the poles are dependent on n
So let us classify this n into two cases. The first case is when n is positive, while the second case is when n is negative. So let us take a specific case of the time index n equal to 2 which is positive and at the same time we will take n equal to minus 2 for the second case. And we would try to find if the poles are dependent on the positive values of n or on the negative values of n for this particular function. Now if n is equal to 2 so this means that this function would simply be z square over 2z minus 1 by 2 and z minus 1. So from x of z now we have added two zeros at origin. But importantly no poles are added. So hence this evaluation is actually quite easy for this particular function when n is greater than or equal to 0. So for the case of n less than 0, so this function for n equal to minus 2 would be 1 over z square z minus 1 by 2 and z minus 1. And of course there's a 2 here as well. So now from x of z now we have added two poles at the origin. So these are actually repeated poles and we need to evaluate them as well. Now let us come back to the case of n greater than 0 and this was a special case. Let us move towards a general case is defined over here that n is greater than or equal to 0. So in this case x of n would be evaluated by the sum of residues evaluated at poles right. So by this we mean that x of n is simply a residue evaluated at this one z minus 1 by 2 so that is we have z minus 1 by 2 times the whole function z power n over z minus 1 by 2 z minus 1 and since it is evaluated at z minus 1 so this means that z is equal to 1 by 2 so this is our residue evaluated at z minus 1 by 2 similarly we have another pole at 1 so in this case we have z minus 1 z n over z minus 1 by 2 and z minus 1 and this time the residue is evaluated at pole which is equal to 1 but do note that we have a 2 here so this means that there will be 2 here and 2 here so we can cancel off this with this function similarly we can cancel off this with this and then we can plug in the values of z in this function so we would have 1 by 2 power n divided by 1 by 2 minus 1 and then this 2 will appear over here plus <coughs> the residue at pole equal to 1 so this is simply 1 power n to 1 minus 1 by 2. Now this is quite straightforward. 1 raised to power n is 1 and 2 into 1 minus 1 by 2. So 2 1 by 2. So this is simply 1. And from here we have 1 by 2 minus 1. So this is minus 1 by 2. So we would have minus here because of the denominator. And from the numerator we have 1 by 2 power n. So this is our x of n when n is greater than or equal to 0 or we can say this is simply 1 minus 1 by 2 power n u of n. But what about when n is less than 0? So that was the case that we discussed over here. So in that case we mentioned that 
for n less than 0 so as we increase the value of n we are going to increase the number of poles or the order of the number of poles at the origin so this would mean that we would have repeated poles and the residues will be evaluated at these repeated poles so just as an example say pi this is our repeated pole and it is repeated m times so in this case the residues for the function x of z n minus 1 this function x of z z n minus 1 and the residues are evaluated at z equal to pi and this this pi has a multiplicity of m so these residues are evaluated by means of the following expression which is 1 over m minus 1 factorial d by dz and the derivative is m minus 1 z minus pi so over here we were multiplying with the specific pole right now again we are multiplying with this pole which is at pi times x of z z n minus 1 and this is actually evaluated at z equal to pi so as the value of multiplicity m increases this expression will become more and more cumbersome so we can say that calculating residues for this problem for n less than 0 is rather involved but we can use an intuition for this particular problem that is our signal was x of z z over 2 z minus 1 by 2 z minus 1 and absolute value of z is greater than 1 so in the ROC we can say we have a pole at 1 by 2 and then we have a pole at 1 and it says that the ROC is outside the outermost pole that is ROC is outside the outermost pole so if this is the case this means that the signal is causal and this would mean that x of n is equal to 0 for n less than 0 Oppenheim uses a change in variable approach in which he sets z is equal to 1 by p and then solves and eventually achieves the same result that is uh, x of n is equal to 0. So for a simple function uh, that derivation is given in the link shown in the chord above. So hence x of n is simply this and for values less than 0 it is 0 so the complexity of taking the inverse transform uh, implied by this particular problem necessitates that we uh, should look into other methods and that is the thing that we would do in the upcoming videos